right, we were talking outside, high intensity working out. Anne founded High Intensity Training Australia? Yes, yes. Uh, so the thing with this is the convention uh, turned me on to a whole different way of life. Uh, sometimes I train in that way, sometimes I don't. You know, sometimes I can take it a little bit easy on myself. But the diet, the uh, fitness, the different weightlifting, the different information that I've heard through this convention, specifically, um, he's, he's a friend of Doug McGuff's, Dr. Doug McGuff, one of the best speeches I've ever seen at the convention. Uh, also, Drew Bay, who was one of the original guys talking about high-intensity training. And I, I ended up, uh, you know, training in those ways and training a whole bunch of different ways, became stronger than I've ever been and laid off a little bit lately. But uh, some interesting stuff. You're going to go over the history of it, yep. all the different dynamics of it. Yep. We're, we're excited to hear about it. It's the last speech of the day. You know, put your thinking caps on, all that fun stuff, and uh, take it away, my man. Okay, go guys. Look, um, I just when I was asked to do the presentation, and probably just with An Anthony and that, um, I started corresponding on different websites from America, the Body by Science website, Drew Bay's website, and um, Anthony start, started to appear on there as well, and we were sort of m making little different sort of chats with each other, and so I sort of got into this um, thing of... Um, then, then eventually he said, oh, I'm coming to Australia to do the 21 convention. And I said, well, I live in Australia, I live in Sydney. And um, if you want to have someone to talk a bit about high-intensity training, I, I sort of put my hand up and said I would. Basically, um, I, I sort of thought with... I teach fitness classes and courses, and I'm thinking, well, what am I going to sort of go with you guys? People might not do much fitness, people might do a lot. Where, where do you fit in with it? So I sort of thought I'd sort of start with a little bit of a history of sort of exercise or a bit of a history of the fitness industry in Australia, a little bit about myself, and then I'll sort of move into a bit of the sort of history of high-intensity training, which is probably one of those things that um, I suppose when you get right into it, you sort of become a bit of a historian. You start to like to hear about the guys from the old days and things like that, and probably that's why I sort of give you those handouts with some of the old sort of um, bodybuilders from the 70s and 80s and that sort of thing. And those guys are all trained high intensity when it first started. So I thought I'd just start there. Um, hopefully, you know, what is hit, you know, does it mean much to you or doesn't it? Hopefully by the end of um, my, my presentation that some of you guys might start looking at high intensity training and at least understand what it means and as opposed to maybe some other different types of training and how it is different to other styles of training that um, people might do. So that's what I'm, my, my aim is to achieve that. Hopefully I can. Um, I'll go through the presentation a little bit. Uh, probably save questions to the end, if that's all right, a little bit. Um, again, hopefully that I can sort of keep you um, sort of not getting too in-depth, because that was the other thing I was sort of thinking, if I make it too technical, and you might sort of not, un, you, know, you know, you sort of might lose track of that a little bit. So plenty of questions at the end. Um, I, sort of, that's where hopefully I will we'll end up with a lot of it yourself. So I just sort of start the presentation and say my name's Stephen Turner, so just again, so if anyone sort of forgets from that, and I'll start from there and we'll work our way through and I'll sort of sort of get you to understand that sort of whole, the whole high intensity sort of training sort of process, what it's all about. Okay. Um, just a brief history of the industry, and I'm only going back here a little bit. The brief history I'm talking a bit about is my own sort of history a little bit to where I started, just like you guys are now. Going to the gym, where it all started, what was it like in them days, you know what I mean, as young fellas like yourselves, that's what I was sort of probably looking at a little bit, you know what I mean, so I thought, well, I could go back, you know, fitness has been there thousands and thousands of years, or exercise, but just how it's generally developed a little bit over the last sort of 40 odd years or so, and probably the experiences I, I, I experienced as well, going to the gym for the first time, what it was all about and a little bit of differences and how that sort of sort of pale on. So just 1960s and 70s, um, bodybuilding only gyms. Does that sort of make any sense to anybody, bodybuilding only gyms? Look, in those days, the gyms were sort of a bit more the old YMCA, police citizens and youth club, um, sort of plates only, weights all over the floor all that sort of thing, dingy sort of rooms for a lot of stuff, you know what I mean? 
guys would go in, they'd have the windows all closed and stuff, and we'd be all in there sweating and, and you know, sort of lifting weights. So in, in, in the sense then that um, that's really what the gyms were about in the 60s and 70s. Have we got that far? Um, I don't know, again, this is where I come sort of a bit more into it, the 70s, 80s, the aerobics boom. Does anybody sort of what I mean by the aerobics boom? The Jane Fonda, the Olivia Newton-Johns, um, we all wore, they wore leotards, we all jumped up on the stage and, you know, done exercise to music. It, it was the first sort of movement where we also started having women, women in the gyms. So we sort of moved from just males, mainly, mostly, and now we've got women coming to the gyms. So the guys and that are a bit smart, what would they do? They turn up to the aerobics class and do the aerobics class with the Jane Fonda leotard, guys with the, uh, girls with the Jane Fonda leotards, et cetera, et cetera. So you sort of went and done those classes mainly to sort of see, get in interaction with the girls and things like that. Um, sort of moving through to the 80s and 90s, we sort of looked at the cardio equipment and various group exercises classes started coming about. So now instead of you going out maybe running, for example, the gyms would have a cardio, what we call a cardio section, where they'd have treadmills and bikes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They'd have group exercise rooms, and then we would move into sort of um, different group exercise classes, such as um, Les Mills pump and those types of things. So those pump classes were sort of made for women to lift weights to a bit of music. That, that, that's the Les Mills sort of aim was. And, you know, we, we sort of also had guys in there as well. But that, and, and, and this is one thing I point out with a lot of people, that for a lot of women when they pointed out is actually some of those pump classes and stuff probably just more a waste of time, you know what I mean? Because there's not a lot of gains and stuff in it. But that was another movement, another movement in the fitness industry, another big major shift as we went through into the 80s and 90s. Sort of going now in the 80s, 90s, and I'm not sure if anybody of you guys has any experience this, the personal training boom started coming along. The fitness first, cl club started opening, and everyone was doing personal training sessions. It sort of moved from now you had your, the thing when the rich person sort of went to his dinner, oh, I've got my personal trainer. So, you know, I've got my personal trainer. Oh, my personal trainer does this, my personal trainer does that sort of thing. So... You, you, if you weren't in the in crowd unless you had a personal trainer in that 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 sort of, especially in those sort of 90s, um, and a lot of the health clubs offered them, but you know you had to pay for them as well. So, um, now to the present, sort of like to this to today, um, which is sort of called the anything goes type stuff. There's PT, boxing, tire throwing, kettlebells. There's a whole sort of different sort of. If you ever go to the gyms, you'll see it all happening or your personal trainers, there's all these different types of training methods. All people trying to sort of get results and things like that with training. So we've sort of progressed through the 60s with the um, old style gyms, basically owned by a, the, the bodybuilder or experienced or the guy or the guy, the owner would own the gyms, one man sort of gyms and stuff like that. Um, and then we sort of had the functional movement. If I just move back now to a fitness accreditation, because as a teacher myself, I involve in accrediting people uh, for the certificate three and four of fitness, or people to work in the fitness industry. So, going back to the 60s and 70s, most of the gyms, the owners were the gyms were run by either the owner or you know a couple of other guys in the gym. That was basically it. You know, I mean, you'd, they would operate through years and years of experience. Those guys had all these years and years of just getting in there, doing doing the weights, you know what I mean? They sort of, what you weren't really university trained at that point, you know what I mean? Those guys just done it from, for the love of it, I suppose, if you want to put it that way. Um, through the 70s and that, and just don't want to show my age too much and things like that, but in about 1978, we had, or in the mid-70s, they introduced fitness leaders as into gyms and stuff as well. So. We sort of moved into this now, um, having people working as gym instructors and group exercise people and, and that, that sort of thing. So courses were just two days, just 
start to work in a gym, you know what I mean? That was sort of in the, in the sort of mid-70s. and most of, the, most of that was aimed at the aerobics, group exercise classes, you know what I mean, that type of thing. Um, just moving the 80s, the fitness leaders, it sort of started to develop a little bit more from, you know, there, there was more injuries were occurring to people, people were getting injured, all these high impact activities, people, you know, from jumping in that all the time. It, it was just so the courses started to grow and develop. We sort of moved from one to owner, one two day course, one or two day courses, now having a course over a uh, couple of weeks. And now, we're sort of in the 90s now, we have a certificate of three fitness and a certificate of four personal trainers. And they, they vary of different, um, var variation of different length of time to do those courses and stuff like that to become a, to work in the fitness industry. Everyone happy enough with that part? Okay, so just, hope, just trying to give you a little bit of broad range on the history of the industry. Um, just my, my own experience, instead of just, like, oh, I can just sort of go back a little bit for you. 1977, I'd done the physical training instructor course with the Royal Australian Navy, actually down at Cerberus, down, um, here in, just down out of Melbourne. Um, most of that was just based on, you know, what we, we worked sort of that flogging, flog you to death sort of attitude, you know. You just got out there and you did it. And if you were told to go and run 10Ks or 20Ks, you just went and done it, you know what I mean? Or you were told to jump and carry weights on your back and jump and that and all, all these things we used to do on them days. You just went and done it. That was it. You didn't. Have, there was no. Oh, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> you didn't. You just went and done it. Um, in the 90s I, or late 80s, 1990s, I got out of the navy and I went and worked at Golden Jail um, in New South Wales. I'm not sure. Just let you know where guys, those people not from Australia, and that. I worked at maximum security jail there, teaching inmates fitness. Anybody ever sort of worked in jails? <laughs> Anybody been in jail? For? Okay, great experience. Um, you know, not sort of to name people and all those sort of things, but there were some really big heavy dudes in them days. I'm talking about some monsters, you know, and guys with some really sort of bad criminal history as well, you know what I mean? So there was a bit of everyone there sort of um, based a lot of it, these guys pumping weights, getting as big as they can. And they'd come and say, Steve, can you tell me about this? Can you tell me about that? And ask them questions. I'd say, look at the size of you, you know what I mean? Sort of me asking them. So... It was a really good experience. Um, guys had all day to train, in a sense, or a lot of them just focused on training while they are in jail. Um, as they got out of jail, I suppose, um, that focus changed to drugs and getting back on the drugs and things like that. Guys that I'd seen come out like, before when they left jail, they were like monsters. Six or 12 months later, they'd be back in jail and they'd be like stick figures. They'd been on the drugs and things like that. So you, you see how the body can change and stuff, you know what I mean, when you're really sort of, I suppose, in a sense, um, being in a strict environment to then having your own choice a little bit. So another great experience. And now, well, 2000 present, I'm a fitness teacher at New South Wales PACE uh, in, in New South Wales, a technical adult further education. Um, anyone have that? Just a little bit of my own sporting career because I thought, I thought this was going to be a little bit important because this is how I got into high intensity training. This is part where I'm sort of going to move to where I actually moved to. So um, a whole history, a lot of years, different training routines, groups and different things and doing a lot of different sports and things. And at some point my sporting career started to come to a bit of an end, which I'll get to in a minute. I was, my main days, a lot of endurance events, I was, you know, um, Australian champion, different triathlon events and things like that, you know what I mean? Um, all my training was based basically endurance, um, aerobic sort of base type training. The only type of, and I, sorry, sorry, probably the only type of, two reasons I've done weight training in a sense was to supplement my triathlon career or my, my endurance events I was involved and maybe to go to the gym and check the girls out at the gym as well sort of thing. So, so at that point, even though I had a reasonably good knowledge of, of sort of weight training or exercise, most of my focus was on, on in these endurance events until I got to a point where I started to get injured. I couldn't train. I was thinking, hang on a minute, I'm sort of, I enjoy my training, I enjoy my exercise. I'm not a fanatic in that sense. I enjoy the triathlons and that, but I sort of was starting to think, you know, injuries are coming, torn calf muscles, I've got to really do something else. So, and I started to think about what I was going to do. So that, that's sort of probably just 
how my initiation in the high intensity training came all about. Uh, weight training, and, and I've done a lot of boxing training occasionally with him too. So now this is just a little bit of the history of the high intensity training, where, where it developed and how it really sort of come different to what most people were doing in that 70s period. This sort of originated in the 1970s. Um, a guy called Arthur Jones was the founder of Nautilus. Uh, I don't know if anyone's used Nautilus equipment or trained Nautilus equipment. It's went out of vogue for a fair while. It's come back into vogue now. But he, he moved into this um, selling Nautilus equipment. So that's sort of where this high intensity training. And Arthur's suggestions to what most people were doing was really just total opposite, total opposite of what they were doing. Okay, he came onto the scene, nobody really knew him, he'd done a bit of bodybuilding, done all these other things, he was about in his 50s or something, and all of a sudden here's this guy telling everybody how to train properly. So he, he was the main driving force. Uh, stories of him, he used to walk around with a gun and stuff, you know what I mean, pistol on his hip and things. He lived in Florida, I think, uh, at that time, in, in D-Land, Florida, um, and he started this movement. Some of the guys you got in the pictures there, which I'll sort of mention in a minute, um, all originated out of this 1970s period. Okay, um, Casey Beata and a few of those other guys, Mike Mensah and them. Um, so Arthur, founder of HIT, Ellington Darden, um, and these guys have all wrote books and stuff, so again, if you want to get a little bit of information about these, see some of these guys. And Jim Flanagan was another one of these um, originators of this high intensity. There's a lot more people involved. So he looked at making exercise machines. Okay, Nautilus type exercise machines. There was a reason why they looked at making exercise machines and I'll sort of try and get into that a little bit in a minute, why that sort of came about. Now, if you just uh, like, Casey Viata was one of the most famous bodybuilders of, of the time. Um, there's pictures of him there. Mike Mensah and Ray and his brother and Sergio Olivia and Frank Zane. Some of these Dorian Yates is, I don't know if anyone heard of Dorian Yates, anyone sort of blood and guts and that, he's got his, um, you go on YouTube and that, if I left that there, he's some really good, sorry, YouTube sort of videos of him if you want to just, um, and I think Dorian's a bit more of the later period too, you know what I mean? So he came a bit later in the 90s, but Mr. Olympia and all those types of people win the bench. Now, this is where I think I come in with the other guys and that, noted authors and stuff that I sort of now started to look at, read, and I start to try and understand what this high intensity training was all about. What did it mean? Uh, Drew Bay, Doug McGuff, John Little, and John Philbin, and there's many more high intensity writers, but they're some of the guys I really sort of like, you know, I mean, when I'm reading stuff and trying to get some more knowledge and et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, Doug McGuff and John Little, 2010, in, uh, wrote or pr produced a book called Body by Science. I know there's a couple of other, Anthony, that's read it, and that. I don't know if anyone's ever heard that, the book Body by Science. I think in some of the YouTube videos or some stuff that Anthony's done before, it sort of um, really started to get people to think as well. Now, if I just go back to John Philbin, he wrote high intensity, more power, more strength in, in a quicker time. If, if I can sort of just give you a couple of minutes here of my sort of initiation, as I said before, I, I started to get a few injuries from triathlons and stuff, and I started to sort of think, well, hang on, what did you do? So one day I picked up this book called, written by John Philbin, and I started to read it. And I thought, oh, okay, that sort of, you know, lifting the weight up and down, etc., and doing these things and doing momentary muscular failure and that. I think, what's all this mean? You know what I mean? So I sort of started to have to teach myself it. And that's how I sort of started to learn it. I started to teach myself, you know what I mean? So what I do for you sort of guys and stuff is that I'd teach myself and I'd go to tape with some students and I'd trial it out on them and see how they handled it. So it was a bit of a... I had my own audience, if you know what I mean, and I used to see how many of them could do it. And a lot of these guys, massively strong guys, just couldn't do it. Guys that trained for hours and stuff, when I'd done it properly with them, or, you know, as we'd done high-intensity training, couldn't do the exercises. And these were guys that were not 
small guys and some of them really big and strong, you know what I mean? So, so I just sort of moved there, but Doug sort of really threw the cat amongst the pigeons 12 minutes a week. How can you do 12 minutes a week? So we had um, sort of, how can I do 12 minutes of training a week? They sort of looked at what they call the big five. And that was they based the exercises on, which was the leg press or, or squat type exercise, overhead press, the lat pull down, chest press, and so I just called them their names. But you can use different free weights and machines and different other variations or body weight that as well if you want to. So it sort of took us to another step. There's a, also Doug's got a website, Body by Science, and basically from that we sort of started to um, look at. Geez, trying to reduce this training down into um, sort of um, 12 minutes a week. I'll come back to this in a minute. Why don't I move a little bit further and I'll go back through the old high intensity training methods and we'll sort of come back through to that if that's all right. So, John Philbin's book. Now, this is what he said the foundation of the high intensity training system is performing the perfect rep. Now, I know um, Mark and even David was talking about the perfect rep. It wasn't how much you lifted or whatever else you did, it was how you did it. Okay, how you performed the perfect repetition. Everything revolved around the perfect rep. So we sort of take away, minimise the momentum and maximise muscle tension. Does anybody sort of understand what I mean by that? Minimise momentum and maximise muscle tension. So all of a sudden, we're not doing the bicep curls like David showed you sort of thing, doing that. We were doing them nice and strict and that, you know what I mean? So we were starting to look at the form, how we did it, not what we did and that it was how we actually did it. Anybody go to the gym? You got many people go to the gym? What do you see at the gym? People exercising. I'm not picking on anyone here, but you'll see a lot of different ways, won't you? And a lot of... When you sort of start looking at what the perfect rep is, you start to look and see what in the gym. A lot of bad stuff. And it becomes quite noticeable. And you see it very, very noticeable. When I'm teaching you know, the guys and even the girls in here, it's TAFE when I teach them, a lot of the girls go to the gym and a lot of the girls don't lift weights. When I take them to the gym, show them how to do the exercise correctly and properly, they're the first ones to come over and say, oh, Steve, look at him, look at him, oh, look at what he's doing. And they, you can pick it up. It's very evident once you sort of know what the perfect repetition is, okay, when you're doing your exercise. So it wasn't like I'm going to do 10 sets or something. I'm going to do perfect reps. And then you start, and once you start there, you start actually then getting into this high-intensity training and what it means, and I'll come to that a little bit in a minute. So the quality of the rep is far more important than the amount of weight being lifted. Yes, we do need a meet, what we what term we use in high intensity well, a meaningful load. We need a, a certain, certain amount of weight to lift, but we don't need a weight that we're going to be, have to be forced to cheat on, which the other guys mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, for, uh, now, if I just now digress back a little bit to the high original high intensity. Arthur Jones and the Nordis, they went from what they called the two seconds up and four seconds down. So they'd raise the weight in two seconds, just using the bicep curl, sorry, as a bit of a demonstration, and they'd lower it in four seconds. Most people were doing a repetition in one and two seconds, and most people were using their back in it. So all of a sudden now we're starting to look at the form and the speed of the repetition and trying to reduce, well, the force and try and reduce the momentum. Why were we doing that for? Trying to focus on the muscle. Okay, so that's a part of that all in there. So, someone else, I think, was it David, had a bit of a go at 10 repetitions. I <laughs> thought he must have took my phone. I don't know if you've seen this. Um, if I just go back to it, uh, 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 sort of the high, or sort of this is for 10 reps. Okay, when we do the first couple of reps, we do what we sort of, and I don't know if anybody's done this a little bit before, but when we lift the weight, we actually, 
we're at our strongest when we first lift the weight. Is that correct? Like your, your, your strength is the most precious as possible. You're the strongest you can be at that point. What you do as those first couple of reps, instead of trying to move the weight fast, you deliberately try to make the, you've got to slow the movement down. You deliberately do that. So you're actually starting to, what are you doing with your strength? You're starting to decrease your strength. So you're actually, your strength is going down, but what's not changing? What's not actually changing? The weight's not changing. The weight stays exactly the same the whole time. The weight never gets any heavier. The only thing is you get weaker. <laughs> okay, understand that? Sort of got that one. So first couple of reps, you hold back the speed. Okay? Now, as you move into the four and seven reps, I just put these down, you'll start to feel that you're getting a little bit more fatigue. Mu muscle is starting to fatigue. It's starting to lose its um, glycogen stores and uh, you know the nutrients in the muscle and the nerve firing and that sort of thing. So that's why I want to go down that path a little bit. Sorry, guys. Um, so your strength's starting to diminish a little bit. And as we said before, and I don't know how Dave knew it, he must have been, you don't stop then. This is where the difference between the high intensity training is and most other styles and types of training. You don't stop when it starts to hurt. Okay, that is the point in time when you're going to start gaining the benefits. That's the point when you're going to have to start using this to focus on that and make what contract? Make the muscle contract. So in that next couple of reps, depending on which exercise it is, those last three, that's really where you're going to get the gain. That's where it's going to be hard and that's where the people do high, the people who stay with high intensity training go to that point where that's what we call, well, what's called momentary muscular failure. Okay, happy enough with that one? Yes, sorry. Yep. Uh, okay, good point. Sorry, I should have. You try, no, you actually try to move the weight faster through your nervous system, but because you're fatigued, the weight will still probably should travel about the same speed. Yeah. So even though now you're on. Yeah, yeah, sorry. As, as, your, as your strength starts to diminish, okay, your intent now is to try and sort of, let's say, move it faster. But in, in reality, the weight should still be moving about the same speed. And that, that was a little bit of the difference, yeah. So it's not that we don't move the weight fast, it's just that we got a bit weaker and we kept, you know, we try to. And just on that, I, I find that's a really good sort of understanding sometimes when I'm training to sort of feel myself, hang on, I'm going to try and move it a bit faster. But I know it's going to move. If I move it too fast and it goes to travels too fast, I sort of pull back a little bit, you know what I mean? But look. There's some variations on all this, and I've got to say that, sorry guys, there's some variations on all this, and um, even in the high intensity training world, there's arguments about how fast you do it and how slow you do it. Okay, so don't, don't worry, there's even big debates there and things like that. So, but my, for me, and trying to pass on to you guys, is it's sort of controlled and not using momentum in that, you know what I mean? So, but getting to a point where you know it's going to start getting uncomfortable. But that's when you don't stop, okay? That's when you don't stop. Stop when your form breaks. Okay, that's when you don't stop. Um, which moves to the next point. And I know this term, the real objective, or when lifting weights, the focus should be on the real objective versus the, what we call the assumed objective, okay? Most people, if I would just sort of have a guess here, would see people training with the assumed objective of moving the weight. Okay? Now, what should be the, what do I mean by the real objective, the contraction of the muscle? For example, if I can use another the bicep curl again, for example, I grab the weight and I don't go, oh, move it. I sort of, this is where you've got to get the focus on that a little bit. This is where it's, a, I'll go a little bit, sorry, a little later. I want to contract the bicep. I want the bicep contracting as opposed to moving it. So it's sort of, it's, it's, it's a part of the mental process you've got to sort of tune into. So it's not, you can't just go and just throw weights around in a sense when you're doing high intensity. You've got to sort of focus. So we say the real objective versus the assumed objective. 
Okay, so again, you'll see it in the gyms all the time. And look, I see heaps of people doing it, you know what I mean? So I tune out a little bit, but when they, you know, I really focus in and when I'm getting really fatigued, I focus more into it, you know what I mean? So um, now uh, this is again I'll go back to Arthur. If you ever sort of want to decide to go to a bit high intensity stuff, Arthur Jones had all these quotes and things over the years, you know, he sort of spoke about, you know, he'd always have some one liner. You know what I mean? Someone had asked him something and he'd always have one line. So I just picked a couple of his quotes I thought were quite good and hopefully then that you might help you a little bit. And I think Mark, sort of, this is what Mark alluded to a little bit as well when he was sort of, train harder. Okay, in a sense. Now, harder doesn't mean the same. I don't want to sort of um, confuse you when I mean by harder. I don't throw the weight more or that. I, I train harder by focusing more, I suppose. That's probably what they put. But briefer or train harder, but don't train less often. Now, when I say about the briefer and that, that was a real big difference to the old days. Well, remember I said about the bodybuilding sort of back in the 70s? Guys were doing 100 sets of bicep curls, you know what I mean? Like things like this. And so when he sort of spoke about training briefer, it didn't mean to do 100 sets. All right. Does that happen after that? Okay. Now, this is the key, I think, or second part of the key, apart from intensity, confidence may be the most important factor for the production of best training results and progress. What do I mean by, does anybody, well, I'll just ask this while we're going to sort of keep you, what do I mean by confidence? Is, is probably apart from intensity. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. There's, just so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, like a positive mindset. Is there anybody else want to add to it? Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, it's a little bit all that, but it's, if I just put a, a big sort of circle around it, the confidence is that training program you do is going to produce the results that you want. So you are confident of that. If you're not confident it's going to, what's going to happen? Not gonna, yeah, you're not gonna, you're not gonna sort of do it. So when I mean by confidence, and if I can just sort of use Mark again, sort of thing for, sorry, for that one, he was sort of when people clients come to him, they're confident that what he's going to do with them is going to give them the results that they want. If they're not confident, they won't push themselves hard enough. They'll, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. You know what I mean? So in a, in a roundabout way. The confidence part, that's why I say I'm confident high intensity is going to give the results that I want. You know what I mean? If I focus on my muscles and stuff and do the right things and go through the process, which I'm going to come to in a minute, it's a learnt process, then I'm confident I'm going to get my results. I'm not going to be changing my whole program. We do change the program, as Mark said, but I don't go and change everything, and go, oh, radical, and I'll start again and all this. I'm confident this is going to work, and that's why I see high intensity training for myself. You know what I mean? So, but that's and and for the rate of progress, the confident, your confident program is going to work for you. Um, just again with the high intensity, a little bit. Ellington Darden again, he was the first person to actually write down what high intensity was, and I'm sort of going to go through a couple of these a little bit for you. Um, Arthur was very much all over the place, Arthur Jones. He never actually wrote down really what he sort of said it and he spoke about it, but he didn't actually contextualise it, what high intensity actually was. So basically what we got down to, intensity. Intensity of effort. Okay, relative, I'll come to, oh, sorry, I got a quote from Drew, so I'll leave the intensity in a minute because I'm going to come to his quote in a minute. Progression. Everything should be aimed at progression. What do I mean by progression? What do I mean by progression? More weight. More weight. Yep, we can we can progress by adding a little bit more weight. Regular adding, okay. Yep, shortening times between reps. Yep. We. Yep. Sorry. Results. Yep. And you want to see results as well. 
and I'm going to come to that again in a minute too, sorry, so you're a little bit ahead of me there. Okay, like I sort of look at progression um, with the weight, yes, but not so much always the weight as well as I think we sort of might have overdone the weight a little bit, but more focusing on the muscle, you know what I mean, making sure the form's right, and but that that's sort of another part. Changing the sort of pre-exhaustion type methods. I don't know if anyone's ever used those. I'll, I'll come to them in a minute, actually. Sorry, so. But yeah, so progression is maybe more reps or not more sets in a sense, but not not with actually when you start to re-progress as well because you can do too much as well. So uh, Recovery. You must have recovery between your training programs or training days and things or some types of recovery. Again, in most training programs, even in the HIT world, they'll have different types of recovery. Some people, once a week, as probably Doug said a little bit, um, some people a couple of times a week, some people will do three times a week. You know what I mean? I generally twice a week. I do two sort of different types of high-intensity training programs, one, one on Monday and one on Thursday. Thursday, because it gives me a three- and a four-day break between them. They're, they're the main sessions I do as far as my resistance training goes, okay? And most of the high-intensity guys will do something of that nature, at least twice a week. We, uh, form. Probably one of the hardest things to sort of explain a little bit, but form, okay, in terms of, remember, this sort of thing, not doing that, okay, doing it correctly. A few other different types of exercises where we do them, but form, and I'm gonna, I'll come to that again in, a little bit later when we're learning the high-intensity. Duration. Basically, you know, how long, 20 minutes or how long you're doing your sets or your training program for and frequency and the order of the exercise, okay? So there's order was all that's so important. Arthur used to always do the uh, uh, bigger muscle first, like the legs and stuff, you know what I mean? And then they'd go to the upper body. What's the biggest, thing? sorry, yep. I oh, know, I was going to say, what's the biggest mistake most people make when they train? And I think actually Mark Lee's having a bit too, so I don't know. What's the biggest mistake? Most people were well, missing about the focus. So they focus on the upper body, okay, and leave the legs alone. Now, at some point in time, what will end up probably happening a little bit is that your upper body will stop, start stop growing. The body sort of holds a proportion. It sort of tries to stay in proportion. So you really need to make sure you work your legs hard as well and... So most guys with the chicken wing, chicken wing legs, okay, um, once, that, once the upper body's grown, it's hard to go back and get the legs to grow again, okay? So you need to sort of really make sure the focus is there and the upper body will grow a bit as well, okay? It will, it will grow in proportion. Um, the original HIT workout is prescribed by Arthur. This is Arthur's original one in 1970s, um, three times per week. 30, well, 30 to 45 minutes, 8 to 10 exercises. Now, they've done a whole body workout, circuit style, and no rest between exercises. So that was one of the original ones they put in the 1970s, and he sort of set it up as a circuit style. You'd go from one exercise straight to the next one, and you'd progress around until you finished um, the program. The Nautilus gyms were set up all around the world and stuff, had that sort of training program when they were doing it. Now, just the author, one of the author guys you got there, Drew Bay. Okay, Drew's, uh, when I write about HIT, I especially mean progressive resistance exercise performed with a high level of intensity. Intensity is your level of effort relative to your momentary ability. What do I sort of mean by this one here? This intensity is your level of effort to your momentary ability. So everyone can train high intensity. Every, everyone can, you know what I mean? That's sort of what I mean is everyone can train high intensity in a sense. Everybody, everyone prob could probably and, and may do it and not even realise it. It's probably a little key part on just probably on, on this one here a little bit. The intensity is your level of effort relative to your momentary ability. Relative to whose effort? Doesn't matter what weight you use. Okay, good. Also, it's relative to you. Not relative to someone else. Relative to you. So basically, remember what I said about the rep? Working through the set? 
okay, you get right to the end and you can't move the weight. That's the sort of traditional high intensity sort of thing and you hold it isometrically for a couple of minutes or a couple of seconds, sorry, and you put it down and you've done everything, your effort. The intensity there sort of is a part of that process and your momentary ability. So if you are really at the end and you're really fatigued with it, you've done everything you can as far as up to that point, okay, as far as your momentary ability. So the intensity of effort is relative to your momentary ability. What high intensity training is not? Now, I sort of wanted to put that up there a little bit, but running, treadmill, running, cycling, paddling, boxing, various groups. A lot of people will actually put out there, um, it's high intensity training or high intensity interval training. It's progressive resistance training, high intensity training. That's what it is, that's, what it, that's why I went back and done the sort of history of it a little bit for you. Okay, you can use a hot lot of high, high level of effort in these, if you're running and that's your goal and those types of things, which it was for me, okay? I mean, I like running and swimming and that sort of thing. But just in terms of, um, it's not what we call high intensity training. Is everyone clear on that part? What I mean now, it's progressive resistance training. So don't get confused by some of uh, um, people using high intensity training outside of that. That's what the original meaning of it was. And that's the, that's the way it is today. Yes, we can do a lot of high level of effort, but it's not high intensity training. Anyone, anyone happy with that part? Um, this is sort of how I describe the six pillars of proper exercise. This is what I put on my um, brochures and stuff that I hand out to people, you know, for training or what I'm trying to explain to them what I'm going to do. High intensity, brief workouts, infrequent workouts, precise record keeping. Why, why, why do I point that one? I didn't point the others. <laughs> Anybody sort of want to have a guess? How many people go to the gym? How many people write down what they do when they're at the gym? Okay, good. It's more than I normally get, okay? If you don't record it and don't keep track of it, you don't know if you're really progressing. You can't commit it to memory, you know what I mean? or I'll, next time I'll go and do that and that. Key part of the whole process is recording what you do. There's different levels of rec record recording if you want. I just generally write down what, how much weight I lifted and I use what, uh, the time under tension method and I write down sometimes, sometimes I write how many reps I did or sometimes how long I've done each set for. So I've done one for a minute or a minute 30 or something and I'll record them. But I can keep track of it. It's my, my way, I know what I'm writing down in the sense there's no one way, but you must use at least a way. And there's a few variations, but you could also go a little bit further and write down how you felt during the workout, you know what I mean? A bit more of a professional athlete type person, you know what I mean? Or someone like that. You might want to record how you slept and things like that, you know, good night's sleep sort of thing, you know what I mean? Okay, so you can probably record them, but at least make sure you write down, if it's even only briefly, a brief note. Most of the people I know who get success in that out of their training have recorded down. It's not just by chance. Okay? It's not. Because you can tell then if your progression's going backwards, which can happen quite quickly. And then it can happen before you know where you before when you know where you are. Oh, all of a sudden I'm I'm not lifting as much, or all of a sudden I'm sort of feeling weaker and that. Oh, hang on, what have I you've got it all written down. Okay, so I really push that to everyone I speak to, especially you know, the students I teach and that, record it, write it down, write down what you do. And nothing unnecessary. You only train what you need to train. Any more training than you need is too much. Okay? Any more training that you need is too much. Um, benefits of HIT, reducing fat levels, improving functional ability, maintaining. Has anyone sort of just heard of all those a little bit? Um, Benefits. Look, most resistance and weight training benefits will be some similar. I've trained a lot of women, probably one of the benefits of the job, high intensity, and their shape changes, and they're very happy. The dress size that they didn't fit in, they now fit in, you know what I mean? For girls, that's a big, important thing. So, um, But basically, there's a lot of benefits to strength training. A lot of benefits, and I'll just use strength training there because there's a lot of different styles of strength training, but 
just we, in high intensity, we know these things work, and I've tested it on people that the high intensity training method works. Right? So I've done the test now. Learning hit. Now, hit is a learnt process. I'm coming now, so hopefully I get towards the end here a little bit. It's not something you can just go in and say, oh, I'm going to throw a few weights around today and I'm going to do high intensity. It's a learnt process. You'll have to go and either, well, be taught by somebody, okay, or do what I did and go back and trial and error a little bit first because nobody else was doing it. Um, or just sort of th th that process and get some advice and that how to structure your program, put it together, and then look at some of your different training methods. So it's not something a lot of people do, but it's a learned process. So just uh, I left those things, especially Drew's website, and that, if you've got it there, great website to go to, so you can follow up on his, you know what I mean, if you want to pick up things. Please go to his website and thank him for that article too once um, you just go in there and say, you know, you are, and thanks, I went to 21 convention and I like your articles or something, you know what I mean? Learn the exercise. It's probably basic in the sense, basic knowledge, but learn the exercises, different variations of doing exercises. Probably learn with what equipment you're using, you know what I mean? What sort of equipment you're using. I don't know, some gyms have got different equipment and things like that, so either what type of equipment you're using. So learn your um, learn correct form. Huge problem, biggest problem. Probably mistake most people. Correct form. Okay. Again, you might need some help there. A mirror is always a good handy if you want to look in the mirror and that and check your form. But make sure you don't you know, minimize momentum, maximize tension. Learn to handle muscular pain about the stress. Um, does anybody sort of know what I mean by that? Learn to handle the muscular pain. I'm going to sort of about the stress. Yeah. Has anybody heard of the fight or flight syndrome? Fight or flight? Get out of me! You know, jump up! Or you're scared, or you someone shut. You know, that's the same process your body's going through when you're actually exercising. So stress, exercise is just a stress-related physiology part in your on your body. Okay, basically what your body just feels it's under attack, and it doesn't know quite what to do. So a lot of people in certain circumstances under that um, fight or flight will. Run. Other people will stay there and hold the ground. You know what I mean? In a sense, this is what you're doing—the same sort of thing. If you know what I mean, you know after a little while that okay, I can handle this. I can keep going. I'm not going to have to drop the weight. I'm not going to have because your body will go into a bit of a shake there for a little while. But once you start getting right into it, you know what I mean? You got to, and that's to say it's a learned process. Don't fear it. Just sort of let it happen. Let the process happen. But. You'll feel once you start getting into it a little bit, and it's a bit of an adrenaline rush too. Actually, you know, I don't know if anyone sort of the endorphins and that type of thing that happen, but that that sort of takes place a little bit. Adrenaline starts firing up, and that. And so control, and this is I mean controlling the, the stress response and concentrate at the event threshold. What do I mean by concentrate at the event threshold? Basically, when that last couple of reps come about. Focus, concentrate. Don't let it drop away from there, okay? That's where the results will come. Um, now, I was just going to sort of go through some advanced overload training techniques. So I learned to do the exercise. I've done the one set and that, and I want to sort of, you know, take it to another level. We heard use the terms advanced overload training techniques. Um, force negatives. Has anybody ever heard the term force negatives? I'm just sort of getting there a little bit, okay? Okay, so when basically um, someone might put a little bit extra resistance on the bar and that new lower it and against a bit of resistance. Okay, um, force negatives a little bit, of, and some of these um, overload techniques a little bit, uh, are limiting a little bit because you need either someone to do them with, you know what I mean, or you need a partner. Sometimes a little bit hard to do them by yourself. But just generally speaking, um, assisted positives, your partner, remember I said you might get to that last couple of reps and you go, oh shit, you know, I'm going to they might just give you a little bit of assistance at that point to raise the weight. Okay, so these are some of the terms. Breakdowns, um, again, come to momentary muscular failure. I do these ones on machines if I'm going to do them because you can change the weight really quickly. You've got to reduce the weight and then just do them again, you know what I mean? A little similar to maybe what some people call drop sets or something. So it is a little different, but it's a variation of that one. But if you're doing it with plates and stuff, you've got to sort of get them off and things like that, you know what I mean? So, but 
still doing, um, and I find them quite good for lap pull downs are really good one seated row type thing. Uh, the pre and post exhaust or, or, or that does anybody know the pre exhaust and post exhaust method? It's a little similar, um, not quite the same. I'll, I'll give you an example. I'll just see if anyone's ever used them. Pre and post exhaust. So, for example, um, I'm going to want to target the, the lat. Say, for example, I do a single joint exercise, like a lat straight arm pull down. I pull it down, so that sort of but my arms are resting, and then I do a, a lat pull down itself. So that's sort of pre-exhausting the lats by doing a single one, then using this mul all the other muscles to do do a little bit further. And basically, the post-exhaustion is the opposite way around, if you know what I mean. Yes, yeah, so you'll do the pull down and then do the straight arm. So a few of those methods that are quite good, and and, and again, once you start playing around with some of these methods and stuff and that, you know, I mean, you, you really get into sort of trial and error and a bit and you, you know, you get sort of a bit hyped up after a while and see which ones you can do. Multiple sets, 10, 8, 6, and there was, um, so the 10, 8, 6 method, the big difference there that most people do when you're doing the 10, 8, 6 is you might do, you, you try trying for 10 reps, but then you actually increase the weight and you should only get eight. Then you'll increase the weight again by about 10%, for example, and then you might just get down to six. So you're actually decreasing the reps, but increasing the weight, where most people do it the opposite way around. They decrease the weight and increase the reps. If you really want a good hard workout when you get into it, that's a good one. Um, just sort of getting along. Yeah, so. Oh, one and a half, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Okay, I'll go back to that. When you're doing, um, say for example, I'm doing the curls and I do a, a full full range, come to halfway and down or something. It, it, it's a little little similar to the 21s and that, you know what I mean, like the, the matrix system method. But um, it's, you do them at the last couple of reps when you're really tired, you know what I mean, or really moments of muscular failure is happening. Yeah, like just just do your set, for like your eight or ten reps first. And if you're doing right, then just that last two, you'll do one and a half then, or the one and a half movement. Yeah, they're a good one, especially on some bicep curls and a few other exercises. Uh, hit is quoted from Drew, is hit dangerous? No, not really. It's not dangerous if you do it correctly. <laughs> it's probably one of the key things. Any exercise program is dangerous if you don't do it correctly anyway. So, uh, force is the product of mass and acceleration. Is training to failure dangerous? No, because really at that point you can't do any more damage because you've decreased your strength. You've actually, as long as you're not using momentum, you've decreased, you've reduced all the force factors. So you still can do it. You've just decreased your strength down, as long as you keep everything consistent. Focus on your muscles, not the numbers. Remember I said so, even though we might be aiming for a number of reps, like I'm going to aim for 10, my focus is on the muscles, okay, so my, still my focus is on the muscles. The, the, after a while, it'll come. It, it, it will come, you know what I mean? The reps and that will come after a while. Is it, is it only for beginners? No, ensure a breaking period for all trainees. Now, quite often in most gyms, and this is where you've got to be very careful trainers and stuff, they'll take you in and they'll flog you to their first training session and you can't walk. No, high intensity to do it properly requires a breaking period. Does anybody know what I mean by a breaking period? Uh, well, look, it doesn't quite have to be that long, but it, usually two or three weeks of just easy stuff, if you know what I mean. So you won't quite go that muscular failure. There were some variations of doing it, but generally speaking, and different body types will require, if you're a bit more sort of thinner, you know, you might need a longer period. You might need a period where you actually for the thinner guy, um, we actually start putting weight on. So you might keep it at low intensity a bit till you actually start putting some size on. Then you might move to the next stage in the real high intensity. If you're a little bit more overweight or something, etc., you might do higher reps, do a bit more reps, you know what I mean, and keep it low. So instead of doing 10, you might do 20. So there's a little bit of variation just on the on your size. So must. If anyone goes in to flog you to death, you guys, especially you young guys, don't do it. There's some really bad 
uh, instances of people being really sort of um, rabdo my life and I think Drew's got a good um, article on his website about that one. That's really when you really got some, you know, you end up in hospital. People end up with morphine and all that sort of stuff. Now, I thought we've been young guys and stuff. Has anybody heard of the term muscle dysmorphia? You have, have you? Some of you have that wedge, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I was just going to, because I just didn't think. Um, been in the industry, and as I said, like, you know, teaching people, this is one of the worst issues and what I think we deal with. You get caught up in the obsession, I suppose, if you want to put it that way. Training or exercise does not have to be an obsession. Okay, you can get good results. Remember the confidence in your program. Okay, you get caught up into this and this is a, 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 a mental disorder and it's a recognised one. So I, I'm really sort of preaching this part to you guys because I'm sort of now looking at young fellas and thinking it's so easy to get caught in the trap. You go to the gyms and stuff and you see all the people prancing around and all this sort of thing and, and check the girls out. But other than that, you see a lot of things there, you know, the bad things. And, and my, I'm talking about experience here. Not happened to me, but I'm talking about experience. I've seen it happen to young guys. I had one young guy in my class a couple of years ago, told him not to do it, sort <laughs> of warned him. They said he's going to get on the steroids and that. You know, I mean, I said, don't do it. Anyway, in six months, 11 kilos of weight he'd put on, but it was all fat. And I know Mark said about measurements. I do skin fold measurements and that. And we've done them all. He just bloated up. Thank God he got off the drugs and stuff, the steroids. He looks quite good now, you know what I mean? But don't, don't go down that path and don't get caught up into this muscle dysmorphia. Um, and as I said, I've had many young guys um, get caught out with that. Fitness centres. Okay, talking about dating and that, what's the other good thing about going to the gym? What else can you do? Hey, talk to who? <laughs> Social side of things there with the girls and that, all right. So, you know, it, 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 look, the gym's a good atmosphere, as I said, you know, something or something, most of them that. But, you know, us guys, high intensity, we just focus on our training. We don't focus on anything else, you know what I mean? Sort of, we just all one way and straight minded. But if you want to sort of other encouragements to go to the gym, you might sort of think a little bit about um, the uh, social aspect of it. And yeah, th th there's that aspect of that as well. So avoid exercise angst. Does anybody know what I mean by that? Avoid exercise angst? No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, the negative, t yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I've got to go to the gym and train. But look, if I don't go and train in the gym today and tomorrow, and that, if I don't go to the tomorrow, look, I've got to go and do, um, you know, I, I get it all the time because I'm, I'm in there with the young guys. I've, I've just got to go and do me back. I've just, okay, that's fine. <laughs> that, that's exercise angst. That's mental thing, not physical physiology. So if you're going to do it, just be a little bit careful you don't get caught up in having exercise. Once you write your program down, write everything down. You, you just look at it the next time you come, you know what I mean? And you focus on other things in life. Avoid drug use, which I said before. And I just say that as in a sense, in a general sense as well. That Thanks. And we've got a few minutes for a few questions. I, I, look, I've probably talked a lot. Hopefully I haven't sort of, you know, and as I said, it is a learned process. It's not going to be something that you will do in learning five minutes. But... I hope you sort of do move towards that way and, and, and I said I'm, I'm sort of really o open to the questions now because I really want to sort of you to ask me and, uh, and I'll you know, do my best to explain or I will explain it to you. So we've covered a whole lot of territory but yes, sorry, yep. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, same, same thing. Hi, Stephen. Thanks for the talk. Um, yeah. Just got a question. Uh, how do you know if you work, say, a specific muscle group, what the maximum weight yeah, like that you can lift? Yeah. Okay. Remember, if I just go back to the form, okay, now this is where, you know, this is, I suppose, my best way of explaining it. If the form breaks, I've either got too much weight. Also, maybe we'll use time under tension method. 
we're aiming for a certain time we want to do it. Like, um, you need to get in this a little bit later, but if I'm doing a, a seven second rep, okay, and I want to do um, 10 reps, that I've got to get to like 70 seconds, you know what I mean? So <clears throat> if I can't get that far, because I might be trying to say a bit more endurance or something, I might need to reduce the weight a little bit. But definitely form, and look, sometimes, and I've, I've done this lately because um, just probably re evaluating myself a little bit and re evaluating the form. For a little while, I'd, I'd reduced the weights a little bit and I went back and really focused on the form to make sure I was doing it correctly, if you know what I mean. Um, so it's a little trial and error, but definitely your form will sort of determine one factor and maybe what your goal is is sort of going to determine the other factors. But as I said, I, and it was really good going back, drop, reducing the weight and just contracting muscles. And, you know, so does that sort of answer your question? So, and look, if you can still handle it, go up and wait. And probably don't make the jumps too big either. Yeah, I just want to ask before you had a slide up, uh, the 12 minute strength training. The five. body by science one, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, can you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Glad that someone asked it. Look, <clears throat> again, probably it was one of the, um, what Doug, Doug McGuff's, but when they wrote Body by Science. Basically what they've done is they worked on about two minutes per exercise and per muscle group. So five, two minutes on an exercise, for example, is 10, then a few seconds or something while you change, you didn't stop between the exercise. Okay, so you went straight from, and they're, they're, it's a whole body workout. Okay, in the one one exercise, but if you look at all the muscles you've targeted, you've targeted every of the major muscle groups in the body through the exercise, like the legs, hips and legs and that. So they're using leg press or squat. Your back, you've got your arms as well. You know what I mean? Like you form with your biceps and that. Um, yes, sir. Uh, when you say strength training, you're talking about the one to three rep range or. No, 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 no. Or are you no. just talking about a general circuit? It's like a general circuit. Now, again, though Doug, sorry, used a, 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 he was using a, a super slow method, which is 10 seconds up and 10 seconds down. So you're doing about, if we look at rep range, and that's what I said, a tempo, and I've got to sort of check these a little bit. That's uh, about four or five reps. But each rep's very slow. There's no momentum whatsoever. Honestly, when you do it properly, it is brutally hard. But you won't do it in the sense first up. It's going to take you a little while to get your weights all sorted out, you know what I mean? And know exactly. Look, if you try to do it in a commercial gym, you'll find it hard because you won't be able to get to the next equipment, you know what I mean, piece of equipment. Um, <clears throat> but it's what when we um, recruit muscle fibres, we recruit them in an orderly fashion. You know, in terms. It's sequential. You, you can trial this yourself anyway. It's quite easy. Because when you do the first couple of reps, you might um, recruit a small percentage of what we call slow fatiguing fibres. As you progress through the set, you should start asking your muscles to recruit more fibres. As you're getting, you'll feel this deep burning sensation down in your muscle. And as the fibres start to sort of get um, some fibres will be dropping out and some fibres will be being picked up. And that's how we sequentially and physiologically recruit or use muscle fibres. So by the time you sort of move to the end of the set, you've worked every fibre. So they've worked from this slow fatiguing, as in Doug's book, in Body by Science, which is the first the fibres you use. You work your intermediate fatiguing, which is <clears throat> what most of us use anyway. It's in the middle. And then you actually work down towards these fast fatiguing. So the slow fatiguing ones we use quite often. Every day you're using them now. You just use them, you know what I mean? You just use them. The intermediate ones you probably use a little bit when we've got to walk upstairs or something like that, you know what I mean? But we use those really deep fibres, those fast fatiguing fibres, requires a hell of a lot of effort. And you'll know when you get them. As I say to all my people, you know when you get fibres because you'll just feel that it's done. It's done. It's all there. If you're not getting them, you're not quite got it right. You know what I mean? So 
you've done everything as far as the muscle is as recruiting sequential fibers in, in its, its sequential fashion from smaller to larger. And as it, it, yeah, it, 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 and as Doug wrote in his book, people won't believe it, but there's people making some great progress on it too. But he doesn't always. He changes his program. Everyone changes. You know, we don't always get this. But you know, I'm just saying. But if you look at what you need to do, basically, bang. That's it. Yep. Is that sort of answer? Yeah. I'll, I'll give you a workout one day. It <laughs> confuse me. Cheers to the speech. It's really good. Very informative. Yeah. If I wanted to train for speed, yeah, will it still be beneficial, or should I be doing something else? No, 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 no. Just it's the same, same sort of. Is it set, working set, the fast switch muscle fibers? Yeah, or? That, exactly the said. If you work through all the fibers in the, in the same orderly fashion, you'll recruit them. Now, when you talk about speed, and I'll, this is what we talk about in high intensity training sort of world, you're not. Are you talking about your speed for a sport? sport speed, yeah. You practice that sport and you practice it fast. There's no exercise that will help with that. Um, your speed of movement. So you practice the skill and you practice that getting faster. You, you, you practice, you do your strength training to get yourself as strong as you possibly can to actually be able to undertake that sport. Yeah. So just practice training fast. Look, you'll find a few variations again, but I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Um, do you believe HIT is the best sort of training method for a bodybuilder? The reason I ask is because I've actually seen and read uh, Doug McGuff's book. Yeah. And he's not really the most biggest guy out, if you yeah. know what I mean. Look, uh, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, 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 no. Because, look, I suppose in a sense, look, I'm not the biggest muscle guy. Well, I'm, I'm nearly 60, you know what I mean? Don't be too many 60 year olds as strong as me. When I go to the gym, I lift twice as much as most 20 year olds. They don't even, they don't even realize how much I'm lifting until they see what's on the bar. It, we, we sort of talk about genetics a little bit, you know what I mean? Now, if you look at Casey Beata, you know what I mean? There's one of his. Now, Casey, they were doing a bit different in the old days in the 70s from the big five. And I will admit, probably the big five won't make you that massive, if you know what I mean. Um, it'll make you strong. But um, I don't, you probably, as in when you go into bodybuilding, you're going to have to probably do some specialization in other muscle groups. Well, that's right, like calves, for instance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you won't get that from a big five. No, no, no. You'll probably have to do some specialization. And um, that, so what, while, while we, we talked about the big five, sorry, is that core sort of group of exercises, and then you can come off that. Look, when I do my program, I do about 10 or 12 exercises, you know what I mean? And I do single joint exercises and things like that. I, I, you know, sort of, so you isolate certain muscles. Yeah, I isolate yeah. certain muscles. Yeah. Okay. But I, I, I don't do it all the time either. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, hogging your microphone here. Um, uh, how do you grow calves? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> calf raises. <laughs> no. um, I know a guy that's very big, very yeah. short, but yeah. very big. Yeah. And he's grown his chest, his yeah. arms all natural. What are, yeah, sorry. Um, but <laughs> yeah. supposedly, well, he doesn't lose it no, if he no, doesn't no. train. Um, and the one thing you can't grow is his calves. Yeah. Okay. If you, there's a couple of little different things here, and we go about the genetics now, and there's muscle lengths and muscle bellies we talk about in the high intensity world of lengths. A lot of guys had, if you look at even those guys there, they all had different sized calves, you know what I mean? Now, so each one's calf can, you only know, can grow at a certain length, if you know what I mean? I'll, I'll give you a quick test in one sec to do, but. Remember I said if I, I would look that he's probably went and by the sounds of it done all this and not done the legs, you know what I mean? Big, big quads, just the calves. Yeah. Look at the insertion points of the calves and that, you know what I mean? But if you simply want to do a genetic test of what, how big your biceps can grow, we can do it quite easy. If everyone just for one minute or half a second grabs their arm like this, just like that, put it like that, put two fingers in here or put a couple of fingers in here, I guarantee there'll be some people who can get two or three fingers in, and I guarantee there'll be some who can only get one finger in. So your bicep, all those people with different bicep lengths, 
their bicep will only grow to one side. They'll all lift gates differently. Uh, no, well, you can't. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> uh, the, the shape will come a little differently in that term. But you can look. It's a simple test, sorry, to see that where the tendon crosses over from the bicep and we'll all have different sort of distances there. So all our muscle belly lengths will be different and they'll all shape differently regardless of what style and type of training we're doing, if you know what I mean, for the bicep. So I'll do my bicep. We, we perfect example. You guys in the gym that do both the same program, look at them, totally different shapes because this is a genetic factor that we, we go into. And that's another whole sort of part of it. But some of those guys, even though, and like the guys, the old bodybuilders, the guys there, like Casey and them, other guys won titles and that because they all had different shapes. And one of the things they said in the old days, and sorry, um, Ellington Darden's book, he said if you cut, cut the head off um, all them old guy bodybuilders, you'd know who, uh, who they were. You go and look at the guys these days and you cut their heads off. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference. You wouldn't know which one was which. They all look the same. They all had differences about them, you know what I mean? You know, they, all, all the old, they all had a different sort of shape in them. Look at Sergio Olivia, you know, his whole bicep, he couldn't close his arm, he couldn't close his, flex his bicep any further than that. You know what I mean? So, because his biceps went over here. So you've got all those genetic factors and, and yeah, so it's probably a, a, another story there too. But, um, his carbs, if you look at his carbs, it's probably short. All right. Yeah. Let's okay. give it up, Thank guys. Awesome speech.